but I sometimes get nervous if I have not seen the movement. But in Africa, surprise can come from anywhere. <laughs> Isn't that the case? worried when she was inviting us after such a beautiful rendition to sing the bad part which says God bless Africa we need a lot of blessings <laughs> we should have done it with exclamation let's put our hands together for our singer again thank you without any waste of time We'll now call upon our Vice Chancellor and Principal so that we can feel at home, we can feel welcome by none other than Professor Amanda Makanya. Let's put our hands together. Uh, Program Director Dr. Figeni, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Figeni is uh, the special advisor to the Vice-Chancellor here 
at the university. So I just want to greet all our dignitaries in the following order, um, starting with uh, His Excellency President Thabo Mbeg, um, the former president of the Republic of South Africa, and the chancellor of this university, who is also the patron of uh, the Thabo Mbeg African Leadership Institute. And let me greet our esteemed speaker this evening, uh, Prime Minister, His Excellency Haile Mariam de, de Saligen, who is the former Prime Minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. I also want to greet uh, members of our council who tonight are led by Mr. Busani Ngaweni and his beloved wife. Um, let me greet Dr. Brigali Abam, the chairperson of the board of the Tabombegi Foundation, and all the members of the Tabombegi Foundation who are with us here tonight. Um, I also want to greet Mr. Max Bokwana, chief executive officer of the Tabombegi Foundation, and his entire team. But uh, it will be necessary for me to also greet uh, Professor uh, Nyamego Panipichana, former well, and vice chancellor of our university, uh, with his beloved wife who is with us here uh, this evening. I also want to greet our uh, minister, um, Minister uh, Mamadou Gubai Nguban, and our deputy minister who are with us here uh, this evening. But I also want to say greetings to uh, Mam Togo Titiza who is a member of parliament, but also the National Executive Committee member of the African National Congress. Let me greet uh, panel members who are going to be joining us uh, later today, uh, this evening. Uh, me Diopolu Pegu, who will be facilitating, and me Christine Kunda, and Professor Jimmy Adesina, who will be our panelists. Um, I also just want to greet uh, uh, my beloved wife, uh, who is with us here tonight. <laughs> it is appropriate for me to greet all our dignitaries uh, made up of the members of the judiciary, uh, members of our business community, our civil society, political formations, government, and all the sectors of our society in various forms who are with us here tonight the President of the National Student Representative Council, Mr. Wazanai uh, Mazetese, and the members of the entire NSRC and RSRCs who are with us here tonight, and all the political formations of our student bodies, leaders of organized labor, members of the media, fellow Africans, distinguished guests who are here with us tonight, and those watching the proceedings on live broadcasts. Good evening. Dumelang, Sanbonan. Huyanand, Abshin, Nda. A very warm welcome to you all. Tonight is a very special night, ladies and gentlemen, because we are celebrating a decade of our excellence. And you'll understand, therefore, when I say that as a University of South Africa and the Tabombegi Foundation, uh, we are especially honored to be hosting the 10th Tabombegi Africa Day Lecture. Long may it continue. This ought to be a launching pad for our creative imagination on what it should evolve into in the next 10 years. It has not escaped my mind that this is also happening on the eve of the inauguration of the South African president to head the sixth administration in our democratic transition since 1994 or 25 years ago. This evening um, is a great one because we have a lecture which is another layer to the critical conversations that we as Africans must have as we explore and confront our past, interrogate our present, and shape the future. Given this historical moment, immediate post our elections, still in a deep introspection and analyses shaped by acute socioeconomic and political challenges, 
as well as rising opportunities facing our continent, this lecture is particularly apposite. We gather here tonight in a year when quite a considerable number of African countries are holding their elections, something that has become a, a common thing happening around us and regular feature of this wave of multi-party democracy since the early 1990s. This evening's theme speaks to the breadth and depth of the challenges that we're facing as a continent. 25 years post-democracy, the national question remains as intractable as ever, and one cannot wonder but about what the late Neville Alexander would have had to say about this thorny issue which continues to bubble under. Rising with unsettling regularity each time we experience societal disruptions and transformation imperatives such as the national elections or decoloniality, which only serve to emphasize our inability to deal with it resolutely. Perhaps we need to ask ourselves with painful honesty if there is in fact an appropriate balance of power and influence among all people in this nation or on our continent. How do we build a sense of genuine nationhood can we do so given the stubborn legacies of separation and exclusion, which seem to transcend time and successive generations? How do we strengthen national unity, coherence, functionality, and pride in the extent that it gains a universal legitimacy and uptake? But is this possible? The same applies to the notions of peace and democracy on our continent. One will be hard pressed to find a general agreement on the shape of the exercise of African democracy. So widely do conceptualization and practices differ on the continent. And peace, of course, seems to be the analogous holy grail. Everyone seems to be looking for it, but no one seems to be closer to finding it. But we can honestly assert that the rest of the world is any better off at this juncture. The generation of an ongoing, unstoppable conversational momentum of these Africa Day lectures provides a necessary framework for stock taking, for provocation, for engagement, for debate, and for deliberate disruption, and a timely call to action. The caliber of global and continental icons that have been attracted by the Tobombegi Foundation and UNISA is concrete proof of the strategic choice that we have made when we partnered with the Tabombegi Foundation and established the Tabombegi Institute for African Leadership. The Africa focus of the Tabombegi Foundation and Timali find a natural and organic synergy with UNISA, whose main strategic intent, as articulated in its vision statement, is to be the African university shaping futures in the service of humanity. The synergies between the Tabombegi Foundation's Africa focus and those of UNISA's strategy, as well as the fact that President Tabombeki is recognized worldwide as the preeminent champion of African Renaissance in the 21st Africa, in an amazing convergence of common purpose. Hence, it's yielding such consequential events as a lecture that we are having tonight. We are proud and excited about making that contribution and will therefore appreciate it when I say that it is a great honor and privilege to extend a warm African welcome to you all as our honored guests on this occasion of the 10th Tabum Begi Africa Day Lecture. I would like to note with much appreciation all the dignitaries and our diplomats who are in our midst. We are most welcome once again. As a university, I trust that this warm greeting that we have, as well as the greeting from the Tabombegi Foundation that we are extending to you all this evening, will reassure you of what truly African and African embrace, you are all most welcome. A special welcome to our patron um, of the Tabombegi African Leadership Institute and UNISA's own chancellor, President Tabombegi, who in a very real sense has become part and parcel of the family of this university. That you always make time, President, to be with us in this institution on occasions like this, 
despite your heavy international, continental, and national commitments, is profoundly significant, speaking as it does to your love for and dedication to the people of this country and the people of our continent. Your presence is a fitting tribute to the rationale for the celebration of Africa Day, the celebration of African unity. Your dedication to the African cause beyond your years of the presidency is an indication of a deep conviction of the mission of the African Renaissance and endeavors to achieve this lofty goal of making the 21st century an African century. We thank you, uh, Mr. President. Mindful of the fact that our keynote speaker and our special guest, that is, the Prime Minister, who is the former Prime Minister of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, His Excellency Haile Mariam de Saladin is to be introduced. I extend to you from my side this heartfelt welcome to South Africa and to the University of South Africa. We are honored, Excellency, by the presence of an African leader and scholar of your international stature and repute whose life and works are a symbol of hope to humanity. Your country, Ethiopia, also holds a special place in this country and our continent, not only as a seat of the African Union, but also for its rich history and heritage, as well as the role that it played in the anti-apartheid and anti-colonial struggles at the time when most African countries had not attained their independence. This 10th Africa Day lecture comes at a time of unprecedented flux in our continent's socio-economic and political fortunes. On our continent alone, there have been and will in the region of 20 elections this year something that we need to celebrate. Not only that, but one descends very clearly in the global context, similar signs, portents perhaps, of a world on the cusp of a profound reorientation and reorganization around and along new lines. The extent of that transformational momentum varies greatly, but it cannot be ignored because doing so will be to our own peril. Because it is against this background that our own quest for the African Renaissance and endeavors to make real the promise of claiming the 21st century as an African century has to be contextualized. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, tonight's lecture will undoubtedly be a celebration of the intellectual and the political, an exposition of some of the most pressing and intractable questions on our continent, which are central to our own respective experiences and futures for the Africa we want. Agenda 2063 states those aspirations fairly appositely. They say, one, it's a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. Two, an integrated continent politically united and based on the ideals of Pan-Africanism and the vision of Africa's renaissance. Three, an Africa of good governance, democracy, respect for human rights, justice, and the rule of law. Four, a peaceful and secure Africa. Five, an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, shared values and ethics. Six, an Africa whose development is people-driven, relying on the potential of African people, especially its women and youth, and caring for its children. And seven, Africa as a strong, united, and influential global player and partner. This lecture will also give us a gauge of the Africa rising narrative as well as the collective aspiration to overcome challenges to make this an African century, as President Tawumbegi promised. This evening's address and discussion will undoubtedly help us to refocus on these genuinely noble aspirations. It will offer us food for thought as we chant our way forward and prompt some healthy self-examination and introspection around our roles as individuals but our roles also as leaders, as intellectuals, and as responsible citizens in the renewal of our country and the renewal of our continent. I just want to say with these few words that you are all most welcome. Feel at home, 
this is your university. It was not a mistake at all that this country chose that this is a university that shall carry its name as the University of South Africa. It is appropriate, appropriate for the activity that we have, appropriate for the work that it does, but also appropriate for the future that we hold so dearly. So thank you very much. You are all most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's put our hands together again for Professor Amanda Makanya. As we move on to the next item, I cannot remember which other university would boast such a strategic partnership which has delivered consistently for 10 years. When you read your program and you see the speakers who have come to speak, uh, you would be excused for thinking that you are name dropping. <clears throat> because these are the kinds of names no university gets every year. In fact, if you get one in 15 years, they ask for lectures to be suspended <clears throat> for a person coming. It's because UNISA is the largest university in Africa and the largest in the Southern Hemisphere. And one of the mega universities, 15 of them in the world. And we do have our campus in Ethiopia as well. Let's put our hands together to that. And we've also trained Ethiopian ministers and DGs in that campus. They graduated master's, PhD. Let's put our hands together. So after that commercial, I'm going straight to the next speaker now. <laughs> the next speaker needs no introduction because she's our former minister and a distinguished leader of the ruling party, parliamentarian, in terms of the stage fright, ah, she's used to things worse than that, <coughs> and energized parliament. So let's put our hands together for Mayor Togo Didiza. Thank you. Thank you very much, Program Director, Vice Chancellor of UDISA, Mr. Manda Makanya, President Mbegi and Chancellor of UNISA, Prime Minister Desalen, Minister Kubai Ngubane, Deputy Minister Nell, the Chairperson of the TMF Board and all board members present, UNISA Council and Management, members of the Diplomatic Corps, our panelists, honored guests, and the student community of UNISA. I'm sure next time I'll also run for office for the SRC. I've seen the fighters here in the Youth League and all of them are here. I didn't see that, so maybe it's also here. Today we mark the 10 years of the Tabambegi Africa Day Lecture in partnership with the University of South Africa. This premier event has and always will be a reservoir of knowledge where we come and reflect on critical issues that face our continent. On the launch of the Tabambegi Africa Leadership Institute, Professor Patili, who's here among us tonight, actually warned us that the work of the Institute should not be confined to South Africa, but its presence must be felt continent-wide. Professor Patili, I want to assure you that we continue to strive for that ideal. Our programs of both the Institute and the Foundation endeavor exactly to execute programs that respond to the call that you made that we do attend to concerns and challenges that our continent face. This lecture, in my view, is a confirmation of our resolve to address challenges and concerns of the African masses. As UNISA being a university in service of community, our role continues to be shaping the futures, making it sure that our contribution through learning and teaching does have an impact in our society. 
Through our teaching, through distance learning, we also offer opportunities for engagement through our short learning uh, programs as well as lectures such as these. We've also endeavored to work with the media, particularly South African media and African channel, SFM, who was our premier partner for a long time, as well as SABC, to ensure that not only those who are here, but also other members of our community, both in South Africa and in the continent, can actually be part of this engagement. The journey of 10 years has been very interesting. We've had lectures, as President Mbeki would say, that a lecture doesn't have a panel. It must be proper. But he had to be defeated in the discourse by the members of the board who said our lecture will be a lecture with a difference, where we have panelists at times. And that has been the journey of engagement. President Mbeki, this year's lecture, the way it has been designed, it has been by popular demand. Last, when we had Professor Mamdani, majority of the participants here were very upset that we did not allow them an opportunity of engagement. So I'm sure you would now agree going forward in the other decade that we'll always have the Tabombegi Africa Day lecture with a difference. And it's only for the Tabombegi and the University of UNISA that we have got such a lecture. I'm now going to invite you to take a journey with us in the past 10 years through a video which will indicate silent issues that were addressed in the past nine years. Who were the presenters? What were the issues that we're dealing with? And do that in a manner that takes us to the next program where we will now have uh, President Beggy introducing our honored guest. But for now, you're invited to walk the journey with me, but through IT. convinced that one of the greatest achievements of the African continent and its organizations, the OAU and the AU, during the first decade of the 21st century, was the acceptance of NEPAD and its partner African peer review mechanism, the APRM, by the rest of the world as a defining program which should inform the relations of the continent with the rest of the international community. We must to shape and mold the future and leave our imprint on events as they pass into history. We seek to determine, to determine whether we are going and chart the course of our destiny. What shall we do to translate the policies and programs our continent has adopted to achieve Africa's re renewal, to transform those into reality? As we celebrate Africa Day, we must therefore identify the practical steps we must take in this regard. One of these is to build and nurture the native intellectual cater committed to the transformation of Africa as visualized by leading African patriots and thinkers for 150 years. An urgent task in this regard is to rebuild and sustain our universities and other centers of learning. Attract back to Africa the intelligentsia that has migrated to the developed north build strong links with intelligentsia in the African diaspora and give the space to these, the time and space they need to help determine the future of the Africans. Throughout the continent today, the search continues for a truly democratic governance that operates in the interest of all citizens. 
There's no denying that Western liberal democracy, with its emphasis on separation of powers, representative government, free, fair and regular elections, rule of law, and accountable bureaucracies, are all attributes that will go a long way in positively transforming African societies. Such reforms, however, must meaningfully work for all citizens who must stamp them with their own characteristics. In Africa today, much of this is work in progress, and it's left to you to conclude it. I make an earnest plea to Africa's young leaders to pick up this gauntlet and proactively set about making our continent and its people a powerful factor in a globalizing world. Africa needs and deserves the Renaissance, and its young leaders must reclaim the legacy and glory of our founding fathers. We, the people, only wish to be governed fairly and justly. We wish to have conditions created for some development and we aspire to be no more than fully human with rights and dignity that we owe to no one. And above all, we strive simply to be African and to proudly shout, I am an African, with President Tabombe. Thank you. Here we are, so many decades of independence, but I will be back. Uh, the Professor Pijana, for instance, mentioned uh, the first uh, that said the Constitutive Act. That's a very important instrument. It's an important document reflecting that African concept. What makes it particularly important is because uh, it actually had to be approved by the African parliament in order to come into force. Any African never had any document or any program that can be owned as an African program as an African government. The challenge to succeed in bringing a full vision, if this is the word, between the leaders and the people, so that they become one. Fifty years ago, this date uh, was a dream. Africa is changed. The world is changed. I thought that at this time, it would have been remiss of me to ignore the 50th anniversary celebrations of the Organization of African Unity. Therefore, I will start precisely there. However, to be honest, I personally believe that despite this strong emotional and historical importance, these celebrations are also taking place in an environment plagued by concerns about the future. These concerns need to be analyzed, clarified and overcome. Thank you. How I see the evolution of our leadership on the continent, I am truly optimistic about our shared future. 
in the direction in which our beloved Africa is headed. I'm optimistic because we've gone through lots of difficulties. We are celebrating the 51st anniversary of the OEU in an independent, democratic, non-racial, non-sexist South Africa. I therefore urge the generation of leaders, I urge you to build on the legacies of all those who came before you, to forge a path for those after you to continue towards realizing a peaceful, prosperous, and united Africa. Nkosikelele Africa, Mungi Barik Africa, Asante Nisana. South Africa is a country that symbolizes much of Africa's history. The injustice, the struggle, the victory, the dreams, and the challenges. I'll talk today about the uprising in North Africa, and specifically the lesson learned and the challenges ahead. But as we know from history, the march to freedom is invariably long, chaotic, and non-linear. Therefore, change in North Africa remains a work in progress. It is time to think differently and act differently. I truly believe, and you should too, that Africa can. Thank you very much. Tonight tells us two things about the continent, uh, that it is on a quest, essentially on a quest for two types of, of things, peace, and there's a reference here to security, but I think we can sum that up as peace, and it's also on a quest for justice. And it's incumbent upon us as a continent to find a way that we can advance these two important values. But out of Africa, uh, new and good things must come. Uh, out of Africa must come new ways of ending conflicts, new understandings of accountability. Out of Africa must come the idea uh, that victims become citizens, become leaders, uh, and, and become equal partners in shaping their own future. And we must be determined to achieve this whether in or out of membership of the International Criminal Court, we must be clear for ourselves what our societies need. Thank you very much. kind of institutional change do we need which will make it possible for us to theorize our own reality, right? Africans in the 1940s was no different from Kosa, from Venda, from Zulu, right? A folk language to theorize the experience of the Africans' people you needed a whole set of institutions which they built in a few decades to theorize the experience of ordinary African speaking people. They built an institutional structure which made it possible to theorize. Now you tell me, where is the institutional structure? Where the experience of Kosa speakers, Fender speakers,
Zulu speakers can be theorized. Where is it? Today, it is Africa Day. We are discussing a subject of gender equality and women's empowerment and how it intersects with the, our quest for development and poverty eradication. The fact that in our country, the one top percent of South Africans own 70.9% of South Africa as well. The fact that the 60 bottom owns 7% of the wealth of this country means that something radical somewhere has to happen. God, something has changed. This is not sustainable. The Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2063, and our INDP, these are the things we want to change. The fact that land ownership pattern is the way it is in our country is a concern, and we should not make it worse. We have to find a solution for it. But what, you, what, what would be radical about this is if, as a result of it, women's poverty was wiped off. The fact that uh, we have come this far in Africa is something to celebrate. <laughs> this is the Security Council we are getting into. We must stand for this value system. We must fight for these people who are victims, underdogs, survivors, because as South Africa, we are better than that. Thank you. That journey, we're now in 2019, the national question. Africa is the only continent, if you look very carefully, that is shaped like a question mark. <laughs> and the dot at the bottom is where South Africa is. Without any waste of time, as a prelude to our chancellor coming, there is a music, very short music item. Then the chancellor will take over introduce our honored guest and over to you let's put our hands together to you
stage let's put our hands together uh, thanks a lot uh, MC has just said, or somebody else did say this, that I was asked to introduce uh, uh, the Prime Minister Haile Mariam Dezalen. Uh, I asked the organizers how long I have <laughs> to introduce him. <clears throat> they said uh, a minute or two. I'm taking my watch off, uh, MC, Sumatra. <clears throat> when I come to two minutes, stop me. Because they said a minute or two. I want to be two minutes. But uh, uh, the Prime Minister Ali Mariam is, uh, I'm introducing him. <laughs> is an engineer. Um, at some point specialized in water engineering. He has been a, a university teacher, has been a, a state manager in the public service, 
He has been prime minister. No, no, no. He has been foreign minister. Then deputy prime minister. And prime minister. That's two minutes. There's one thing again that is common between uh, the Prime Minister Haile Mariam and myself, in that uh, he resigned from government last year. You remember I did that some years before <laughs> him. <laughs> Under very different circumstances. His resignation was good. <clears throat> I will say nothing about the other resignation. <laughs> you know, at the end uh, of each one of our uh, Africa Day lectures, we spent quite a bit of time discussing the question as to what do we do for next year? And when we raised this matter last year, um, somebody did say, uh, MC, that this would be the 10th uh, Africa Day lecture. And so the idea came, I don't know from where, that maybe we should ask the Prime Minister, Ida Mariam, to deliver this lecture. We all agreed. And there were two reasons for that. One was uh, historical. I think as South Africans here, yeah, we all know that Ethiopia has been with us in the public consciousness of many of our people at the center of the striving to liberate this country since the 19th century. Our, best, our very first modern intellectuals, people like Dio Soga, spoke about Ethiopia in the context of our struggle even then. And all of us know that when Africans broke away from the churches which had come from Europe, the precursors of our liberation movement here, those churches, they call themselves the Ethiopian Church. Yeah. I'm sitting next to a, a Panipichan. You know him as a professor and things like that. <coughs> but he's a reverend. He's also Reverend Panipichan. So what I'm going to read here, he will know. Panit comes from Psalm 68. You know therefore what it is. It says, rebuke the company of spearmen, the multitude of the bulls, with the calves of the people, till everyone submit himself with pieces of silver. Scatter thou the people that delight in war. Princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall soon stretch out their hands, unto God. And this is why you had the Ethiopian churches. They took this from Psalm number 68 of the Holy Bible. You'd find uh, the historians among us will know this. You'd find, for instance, in colonial documents of colonial Natal, when they were talking about the person who became the first president of the ANC, John, John Dube, they called him an Ethiopian. 
The reason for that was because at the turn of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, what came to be called in this country, African nationalism, was then called Ethiopianism. I'm saying this is a historical connection that we have with Ethiopia, that our struggle has with Ethiopia over a long period of time. And so when we said this is the 10th, 10th, 10th Africa Day lecture, we said, look, let's, let's, let's go and fetch that Ethiopian. Um, <laughs> And the other reason, apart from that historical one, was a strategic one. Um, a premier, uh, Haile Mariam's predecessor, it was Meles Zanawi. Um, and there's one thing that Meles kept raising with me, which was a complaint. It was a complaint about how we were handling ourselves as South Africans, and particularly as the ANC. And he would say to me, you know very well the things that we're trying to do in Ethiopia, for instance, with the economy, which some other people in the world don't like. For instance, just as an example, uh, <clears throat> Banking, banking, that Ethiopia would not allow foreign banks to come into Ethiopia. This was to ensure that you develop the indigenous banking system and make sure that it has the resources, capital available to develop the Ethiopian economy. That it would be better at that point not to allow an entry by the foreign banks. So Meles would then say to me, you know very well that there are many people in the world who disagree with that, who talk about globalization and opening up of markets and you know all of that. And he says to me, but the reason we are doing it in Ethiopia is because we know we've got South Africa that will defend us. <laughs> and if you people continue to go this wrong direction which we are going, we will lose that defense and it will be impossible for us to transform Ethiopia. He would raise this thing consistently with me and indeed he, in many instances, was much better educated about South Africa than I was. <laughs> we have continued to that tradition with the Prime Minister Hal Maria of engaging each other about Ethiopia, about South Africa, about his political party, the EPRDF, and about the ANC. And an interesting thing is uh, that many of the troubles and problems that the ANC is experiencing now the EPRDF has experienced. So it's possible to discuss all this and for me to say to him, what shall we do? And drawing on the experience of the EPRDF, he has suggestions which he puts to me, which I shall not disclose. Um, but they are about what is it that we need to do in order to build the kind of organization that our continent needs in order to be able to carry out its tasks of recon reconstruction. That's the advice he gives. <clears throat> it's advice which is very easy to understand because it comes from practical experience. Ethiopia also is very important because for a number of years now, it has responded under the leadership of the EPRDF in very, very interesting ways to the challenges of development. 
a task which faces us globally on the continent, a challenge of development. And there are many, many things that we can learn from Ethiopia about how to address that question. I'm saying these are strategic considerations about the politics of Africa, the political organizations, the progressive ones, challenges of development. The only government on the continent currently which has got 50-50 uh, representation of gender, national government is Ethiopia. There's no other. <laughs> So there are many things that it seemed to us as we listened to this 10th uh, Africa Day lecture on an important issue, the national question which even in this country has not been solved. In certain senses we have regressed, that's why you get these notions of 100% uh, Zulu. That's a regression. Uh, <clears throat> you can't. <clears throat> but it addresses, it points to the importance of the lecture that we're about to listen to on the national question. And my view it, uh, is that uh, there's no better person to deliver it than uh, Prime Minister Haile Maria. Welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Your Excellency and dear brother, President Thabo Mbeki, distinguished participants, I am truly excited to deliver this speech amongst you today with the academic community, diplomats, young students and our current and future leaders. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak in this distinguished audience. First of all, I brought greetings to you from your ancestors' land, Ethiopia. All humanity has begun in that part of Africa. Yeah. And I think you ha we have something to deliver again at this moment of our history. I believe when President Mbeki asked me to deliver this speech in front of this distinguished audience, I say to me, yes, I, I should do this because I have a duty to do so. On one hand, we Africans, we are trying to have a prosperous, peaceful, integrated continent. But on the other hand, we have extreme and ultra-nationalists, ethno-nationalists, pulling apart not only our continent, but specific countries in Africa where they want to have states equal to languages in Africa, tiny states which cannot compete in the global setting. So this is a moment that we have to discuss 
And I think we have to catch the bull by the horn in this moment so that we can have a resolution, maybe a direction in this discussion to the future of our continent. So I think this is why I have taken this heavy responsibility to speak about the national tensions we are experiencing at this moment in our continent. But how can we do that? I believe that we, we have to think this issue at the Africa-wide level. We cannot resolve this issue looking into specific countries, except that getting some experiences from these specific countries. We have to discuss openly and genuinely at the African level. I believe this forum is one of it. Again, I think we have also a duty to pass our Africa, get Africa in order before we pass it down to our children. So many leaders that have come before us have laid the foundation for us. We don't need now to make you know, a liberation struggle, but we have to focus our, our internal struggles. Even though still weak, we can also say with certain humility that they have built really important institutions. We can improve them, but in most cases, we will not have to create them from, from scratch. And almost 60, 66 years after our predecessors sat in our capital Addis Ababa and forged the African Union, they then known as African Organization of African Unity, we are finally talking about continental economic integration in which we can trade amongst ourselves free of tariffs. But we have challenges ahead. The thing is, we have put this continental free trade area as our blueprint. But on the other hand, there is a question ra raised as a sovereign right issue, and many countries are backtracking from this agreement not to ratify this very important blueprint. I think this is the mentality we have to fight before talking about our national issues. I'll come later on on the national question. Again, on the other hand, as we are trying to bring this continent together, as I said, as they look at even smaller countries, and perhaps as many countries as a language, as I said, but even is, is this politically palpable? That we have to question ourselves. Which are the countries which are competing very well in the global setting? It is United States, it is Brazil, it is China, it is India. I think these are the countries, because of their size, they are capable of competing. We are Africans, as balkanized as we are now. Can we compete? Can we survive? is a question that the academic community and the political leadership should respond at this moment. I think when you come to national question, yes, we are trying to have an integrated, peaceful, and prosperous Africa, but we have legitimate questions, national questions, that has to be addressed. So can we integrate Africa without addressing the legitimate quest of national questions in specific countries? 
I believe we can't. So I think if we want to integrate our continent, we have to also focus on addressing the national question that's looming in specific countries. So today, I wanted to deliver on the experience of my own country, Ethiopia, so that lessons can be learned. Because Africa is very, very diverse, and we cannot address it all at a time. But the specific re I mean, experience of my own country can help to see for the intellectual community to make a deeper research on the issue of national question in Africa. So I will focus in this regard. But I want to challenge Africa's intellectual community. How do we define nation, nationalities, and national movements or national question? I think we always see that there are Western tradition and Western definition for the national question on one hand. And there is also Eastern European definition of the national question. Which definition helps us Africans to understand what national question is all about? And given our colonial and apartheid legacy, how can we define national question looking into specific countries like Ethiopia or South Africa? Let me mention both Ethiopia and South Africa, one example. If you see Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa setting, we have nationalities that are common to all of us in the Horn of Africa. You can take an example, Somali national. The Somali nation is in Kenya. The Somali nation proper in Somalia. The Somali nation is in Ethiopia in a sizable number, even comparable to what is Somalia proper. And the Somali nation is in Djibouti. How can we address the Somali nation question without looking into the Horn of Africa proper by just looking Somalia or Ethiopia? So how can we define then the national question as far as we Africans are concerned? Because our borders are drawn for us by the colonial masters. And I think this is an important issue. But let me come, I have very little understanding of South Africa, but how can you define national question without looking into Botswana, Lesotho, Swatini in South Africa. So I, today I want to challenge our intellectual community. What do we mean by national question as far as Africa is concerned? Given this challenge, let me focus on, on my country, uh, Ethiopia, because I have no other choice at this moment. <laughs> I am an engineer, I am not a social scientist, but my experience comes from my leadership experience in my own country. So uh, let me try to begin by um, you know, putting some of the common things. But before that, some of the scholars has put some definitions to us about nations and national question. I think according to Ernest Renan, he said nation is a distinctive historical consciousness whose grounds are to be found in the common past and the will to live together in the present. Ethnic origin, language, religion, and territory need not be decisive factors. So, is nation equivalent to ethnicity? I don't think so, according to this definition. 
So we have to think about what do we mean by nation. Again, some other scholar, Max Weber, said in his part, the political dimension of the national phenomena, he said, he argues that the concept of the nation is not empirically definable. For him, national identity flows from the feeling of solidarity in relation to other groups, and national solidarity from the memory of a common political faith. So again, it, has, it is not primordial. It's not related to our blood. It's, it's not related to our you know, uh, ethnicity, for say. So I think when we talk about national question, we have to clarify this. From the far left ideologies, which I mentioned from Eastern European dimension, especially from Soviet Union and the Yugoslavia and uh, Czech, Czechoslovakia, and what happened in those areas, I think two important politicians, they have defined as follows. Otto Bauer, and it's, he's an Austro-Marxist and a social democrat, and Stalin, who from within the communist movement gave the longest abiding and eclectic definition of the nation, is summarized as follows. For Bauer, certain characteristics make up the nation only in the context of interdependence. The essential element is common history. So again, you can see similarities, whether it's from East or from West, there is a convergence of definitions as far as nation is concerned. And in various nations, these elements occur in various combinations. According to him, the nation emerged from the community of origins and the community of cultures. Language is a distinctive feature of a nation only if it produces the community of culture. He defines the nation as the totality of peoples united by a common faith, again. Stalin, in his part, said that the nation is a historically formed stable community of people based on the community of language, territory, economic life, and character which is manifested in the community of culture. For Stalin, only all, all these elements make up a nation. And a Slovenian scholar, Kargel, has defined nations as emerging together with capitalist production. That he said a nation is a specific people's community which resulted from the social division of labor in capitalism or at its, its level of development of the means of production when the quantity of the surplus of social labor began to be transformed into a new quality of the social integration on a higher level. Stanley's definition of the nation and that of Karjol is criticized by other scholars and politicians that they did not grasp that the nation is a political phenomena, expressing political interests of a community. And besides, in his definition, Stalin does not mention the level of economic development, a prerequisite for the formation of nations. I think I can mention a number of Western It's a challenge because uh, maybe the university can think about this issue later on. Uh, the podium, uh, I think, uh, should be improved. Um, in any case, I think I, I will struggle with it because we are so much energized by the music and um, that was very entertaining. Thank you, sister, for this. Um, 
An American political scientist, Welker Connor, has also said about nation, what matters is not what is, but what belief is. I mean, what matters is not what you are as an ethnicity, but what you believe in. So that includes also your will to come together and integrate. So I think there is an important issue in these definitions, both from the Marxism camp, also from the liberalism camp. Both of them, they have a common definition as far as nation is concerned. That I bring because in most cases, nation is mistaken with ethnicity in Africa. So, I think having said this, therefore, a national question is a question consisting of the political mobilization and the struggle by dissatisfied and aggrieved nation to redress and exact more just and equitable accommodation. How can we do that? To me, national question is a term used for a variety of issues related to national development. That's how to structure the nation in order to accommodate groups and guarantee access to political power and equitable distribution of resources for common good. Therefore, the national question focuses on the competition and the conflict between and among different nationalities or groups or nations to control the political power and the resources. That shouldn't be mistaken. In Ethiopia, and in Nigeria, for example, the background to national question is the perceived and real domination of political elite of some groups by the other due to historical and structural nature of the nation, such as center-periphery relationship. I think this is very essential. When you come to, let me give you a bird's eye view on the political history of my country, where you can understand how the national question has come about. We Ethiopians, we trace our history to more than 4,500 years back. Historical evidences show that Ethiopian or Abyssinian the president was mentioning about the church. You know, we have Abyssinian church all over the United States. Because there is a meaning about it, not, on, not only because of the biblical issues, but the contribution that Ethiopians has made to Africans and all oppressed people in the globe. So I think this empire, even though it has its own drawbacks, has contributed to you know, see how the black people should be treated in this, in this world. And chronicles of kings and queens, stale and stone inscriptions testify that there were more varied and smaller ethnic groups living in the northeastern African region now called Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Djibouti, and the Sudan. Than there is today. There has been a process where small ethnic groups has integrated into a bigger ones in our area, the Horn of Africa area. So I think historical evidence is so there is a movement, you know, an integration process that was taking. But that has been halted 
by the colonial aggression of these Horn of Africa countries. By now, we could have emerged as a big nation because of the balkanization and inter-ethnic conflicts that the colonial has introduced into our Horn of Africa, I think that process has been halted. So we have to remember that this natural process should be looked into. And again, during the second and half and the uh, half of the 18th century and the first half of the 19th century, regional warlords have taken precedence over the central government of the empire. Regional lords that refer themselves to as princes for, fought for supremacy and to be the guardians of the monarchs that have just been confined to the Gondarian castle in the town of Gondar. Since the monarchs were considered sacred and ordained by the order of God, the lords did not have the courage to claim the throne. The wars fought among them and sometimes taken ethnic lines between the Oromo, the Tigray, the Amara, and the Ago. But at this moment now, because of historical reasons, the Oromo movement has started from the south part of Ethiopia and has gone to the north and, and southeast and southwest in large number by integrating many small ethnic groups in the country. Now, the Oromo is the largest ethnic group. People say it's the largest ethnic group without understanding that it is not an ethnic group because it is an integration of many smaller ethnic groups by the process of the cultural you know, integration process that the Oromo had. So I think now this, this Romo nation, that process has halted, otherwise could have you know, developed in a new way in my country. I think as part of its share in the Berlin Conference, Italy has attempted to colonize Ethiopia in 1896. However, Ethiopia has successfully defeated Italy at the Battle of Adwa. Many Africans and Latin Americans and Asian people have taken the victory of Adwa as a symbol of independence, liberty, and equality, especially against the European and white colonialists. I think, therefore, Italy has um, returned empty-handed without being able to succeed what it came for. But my point is, again, how is the current Ethiopia and its people and its territory is shaped? You know, internally, before fighting with the Italian colonial aggression. Emperor Menelik II, which was a very wise leader, he knew that he cannot fight only having the Abyssinian Empire. So he has to move to the south and southwest in order to get the human resources and the material resources that's necessary to, you know, uh, to fight the aggressive Italian force. So I think because of that, he has made a conquest. By the time many people might think that his conquest to the south and southwest and again southeast could be an aggression by an, an emperor from the Abyssinia. But it has a very good meaning in such a way that the forces of the whole ethnic groups in the south and southwest of Ethiopia helped in the Battle of Adwa. There is a chronicle which every one of us are very happy with, and President Becky is fond of it, I know, in your lecture. 
You know, when we were fighting with Italian colonialists, the chronicle reads that the general, General Alula, was a very efficient and war strategist general. And he saw that the two generals of Italy coming in a different directions, and there is a valley where if the communication is not cut, then they are obviously going to defeat the Ethiopian force. So the general asked Emperor Menelik that we have to cut the communication of these two Italian warring generals. And then Menelik agreed. And the good thing is the Oromos are very known horse riders and fighters. So Menelik strategized that the Oromos take, take up this valley very quickly so that the two generals of Italians will not meet with each other and conquer the Ethiopian soldiers. So the point is here, and Alula is a Tigrayan, and he knows the topography. He was part of and parcel of that area. His strategy, coupled with a very strategic leadership of an Amara Highlander, which is Emperor Menelik, and the Oromo warriors and horsemen involved in it. That's why people are always asking us, how did you manage to defeat the Italian aggression? It's simply because all the nations of Ethiopia has collaborated in fighting this external aggression. So I think the, the national question comes from the history we have and the common fate we are going to face. And I think that ideal is the most important things we have, we have to learn from, from the Ethiopian history. But still, In the wake of the 20th century, European superpowers of the time were approaching the then successor to Emperor Menelik, Liji Yasu, to have him on their side in their fight to conquer back again. He being a mixed origin on one hand from the Muslim convert Oromo, Romo father and the Christian Amahara mother. Liji Yasu made himself busy amalgamating forces from peripheral areas, notably Muslim regions, of, regions such as Harar, Djibouti, and Somali, hedging the, the central throne. He was not like, liked by the aristocrats of the central government due to his alleged advocacy of Islam, leading to his imprisonment and later demise. He is credited to have attempted to modernize Ethiopian politics by including peripheral warlords to the politics of the central government. The point is here, again, given all these positive things, the national question has not been addressed by the imperial rule, apart from the aggression coming from outside. But internally, the cohesion has not been Anyway, I'll try to manage it. <laughs> so I think the point is, I'm trying to make a point that, you know, when you are unified, you can be very strong. But 
again, when you are dissociated internally, then you become weaker. So I think we need to have a lesson that should be learned from our monarchy and what has happened in my country. Again, you know, Emperor Haile Selassie, second, which is the most modern emperor in, in Africa. And he is the cousin of Emperor Milik II. And while he, Haile Selassie, issued the first ever constitution to the empire in 1971. While the constitution could be admired since it was the first ever move by an emperor to be issued to his people, it was highly limited in scope and rather gave written mandate of sub subjugation of the mass under the kingdom. Some historians argue that the constitution was issued as a matter of the fact that it was a prerequisite in order to join the League of Nations. It did not have any room to answer questions of human, democratic, and equal participation rights, both economic and political rights. Therefore, had no energy to address the looming national question of the time. One point here we have to address is, you know, the national question becomes intensified when there is modernization in the country. As, as I said, the definitions which I mentioned earlier, you know, during Emperor Haile Selassie, capitalism was fledgling in the wombs of feudalism. That was a time when huge questions are coming from every direction. So I think one point we have to take into consideration is the point that uh, modernization is the main issue. But again, Haile Selassie, I do not want to go into the details of the, the historical records, but he issued another constitution in the second, called Second Constitution, 1955. This was a much awaited one, especially by the intelligentsia, as they were expecting to see a constitution that resembles the ones in the likes of England, Belgium, Spain, and most of Scandinavian countries that where majority of them were educated in those countries. To the dismay of them and the entire Ethiopian people, the constitution but recognized the emperor as the only rightful owner of the land, the water, and the people of Ethiopia. That meant that it is absolute monarchy instead of much sought constitutional monarchy. That, that is a point in Ethiopian history where many scholars say it's a lost opportunity. Had it been a constitutional monarchy, the country would have not degenerated into different you know, national questions and, and uh, uh, other things. But again, concurrently, you know the situation of Eritrea had exacerbated the problem of Ethiopian politics. Historically, Eritrea was always the most northern part of Ethiopia for ages. Many historical accounts describe parts of the current Eritrea as being governed by the Ethiopian Empire, that it shares the ancient and medieval history of Ethiopia as Midrbahar. Midrbahar literally translated as land of the sea. Of course, it was it will be worthwhile to mention that some foreign powers like the Ottoman Turk and Egyptians has occupied the coastal area of, of uh, this land. Again, the invasion of uh, the colonials, colonialists through Asab made the formal colony of Eritrea and it was created in 1890. I think our emperor was not able to fight during this invasion simply because we know our uh, you know, fire capacity and we, we know the difficulty of logistics and as well as uh, the Russians. But when Italy, Italy defeated in, again, 
in 1941, Eritrea became Confederates of Ethiopia under the UN resolution. Nonetheless, in 1962, the emperor had decided to unilaterally dissolve the Eritrean parliament and reclaim the territory of Eritrea as part of unitary Ethiopia. So it, there comes intensified national question in Ethiopia. The action of the emperor caused a great, great deal of disappointment, resentment among the Eritrean people. Again, the Eritrean liberation movement and the Eritrean Liberation Front were formed in 1958 and 1968, respectively, as liberation movements. So what, one of the first modern liberation movement that's formed in Ethiopia. So the war for independence followed for the next 30 consecutive years until Eritrea won its independence from Ethiopia in 1993. Again, the history of Ethiopia. The emperor's inaction to modernize Ethiopian politics toward creating a state in which all individuals and groups enjoy their democratic and human rights, coupled with the agenda of the world superpowers toward the Horn of Africa, had given birth to what's known as Ethiopian student movement. Again, another intensified national movement started in this part. Let me quote one of the most important quotations we have as far as Ethiopia is concerned by the leader of the student movement, one of the leaders, of course. Notable among these lines was a line pursued by Waleling Mokonin, a member of the perceived dominant nation. By the time Amahara, Amahara nation was considered to be the dominant nation in Ethiopia. But this individual is a member of that dominant nation. He wrote a controversial and yet still debate about article regarding what he refers to the question of nationalities of Ethiopia. He wrote, I quote, the socialist forces in the student movement till now have found it very risky and inconvenient to bring into the open certain fundamental questions because of their fear of being misunderstood. One of the delicate issues which have not yet been resolved up to now is the question of nationalities. Some people call it ridiculously tribalism, but to me, it's a national question. Panel discussions, articles in the Struggle magazine. There is one magazine called the Struggle. And occasional speakers, clandestine leaflets, and even Tetate groups have not really delved into it seriously. He said again, I quote, what are the Ethiopian people composed of? I stress on the word of peoples because Sociologically, sociologically speaking, at this stage, Ethiopia is not really one nation. It's made up of dozens of nationalities with their own languages, ways of dressing, history, social organization, and territorial entity. And what else is a nation? He asks, is it not made up of people with a particular tongue particular ways of dressing, particular history, and particular social and economic organization. Then may I conclude that in Ethiopia, there is Oromo nation, the Tigray nation, the Amhara nation, the Gurage nation, the Sidama nation, the Wolamu, now Wolaita nation, the Adere, now Harari nation, and however much you, you may not like it, the Somali nation. Such an article has become the basis upon which a debate on national question for almost all of the political struggle in Ethiopia has openly been pursued. 
until 1974, when the imperial regime was toppled down by junior military junta known as Derg. So again, since the Derg came to power, you know, before the Derg came to power, this student movement was not organized. It was just a prizing of students and was not properly organized. So the Derg was able to come and snatch the power in Ethiopia. But again, this Derg has no programs for resolving the burning national question, then the Derg started stifling all rights of the people. Therefore, this student movement has changed into national liberation movements. So that's why you find in the northern part of Ethiopia, the Tigray Liberation Front, closer to the Eritrean Liberation Front, and western part of Ethiopia and southwestern part of Ethiopia, you find the Gambella People's Liberation Front, and again the western part, the Berta People's Liberation Front, in the eastern part, the Ogaden Liberation Front, the Ogaden Nation Liberation Front. I can name them all, but 17 armed national liberation fronts has been formed in Ethiopia. So I think the point is not the national question in Ethiopia has become and began intensively. So the Derg immediately noticed this. And then initially, the student movement, one of the big questions was a question of land ownership. So the Derg was forced because by the time 92% of the Ethiopian population is an agrarian and a peasant population. So the land issue was critical the Derg could have been toppled immediately because that was raised by the student movement. So the Derg was immediately able to respond to this land issue and the agenda of land for the tiller has come and, and it has got a resolution. But until now, for Ethiopian development, the land issue which has been responded by them has helped Ethiopia to move very fast in its agrarian transformation agenda. But the next question was the question of nations and nationalities. In the beginning, the Derg has never accepted this because he said it's just an ignorant, these narrow nationalists are posing this question. It's not the question of the people. But when these 17 armed groups intensified the struggle from every corner of Ethiopia, then the Derg was forced to respond and put in place the so-called Institute for Nationalities. And that institute has studied the nature of nationalities in our country. And the Derg tried to respond in two ways. Where there is no national question, they instituted a so-called area administration. And when there is national questions, the Derg again instituted autonomous regional administrations. So they started addressing those things. But again, the point is national questions cannot be addressed without democratizing the whole societal programs. Then comes democracy. I mean, after five years of responding to these questions undemocratically, but the Derg was not able to stay in power. It was toppled by these armed struggling groups. Then APRDF came to power by defeating you know, the Derg regime, you all know. And one of the main issues that 
EPRDF tried to respond was on the national question. So the issue was raised and debated. And initially, the provisional government was instituted, and later on, a transitional government, which, which was inclusive all of all the groups, has come into play. But again, that was not enough, because some of the national groups, they left the transitional process thinking that they are pushed by the EPRDF. And they didn't stay. And until now, it has become a problem to the country. So I think we have to look into, of course, it is said to be their own problem to abandon the transitional process. But in any case, there should be tolerance and inclusiveness in any case to respond to these kind of questions. When you leave aside a certain group from the political discourse, then later on it will haunt you and it becomes a problem. Some of the groups like OLF and ONLF who left this transitional process has become a problem to the country until today. So I think democratic process is essential in addressing the national question uh, in our continent. But let me come to the point how um, EPDF has tried to address this national issue. And the first thing which EPRDF has done was, I said, an inclusive transitional process, but that process has its own shortcomings, uh, which I will mention it later on. The drafting of the constitution, which is the fourth constitution in Ethiopia, has tried to address all these national questions. The first thing is we have to accept the universal, universally ac accepted human, political, and democratic rights enshrined by the United Nations. That was part and parcel of our constitution. And the second issue was we have tried to address both individual rights as well as group rights in equal measures. There is a tension now. Again, until today, the tension comes from ethno-nationalist radical groups on one hand, with advocating that without having exclusively a state, the national question cannot be addressed. And they are fighting for secession. On the other hand, pan-Ethiopian nationalists, which believe that there is no national question for say, but if we address individual rights then the national question automatically will be addressed. These are two polarized views still becoming one of the areas where debate continued. So I think, how can we moderate this tension? It's a big question in my country now. And I urge political scientists and sociologists here in this gathering to help us in understanding what it all means to have these two polarized questions could be moderated. I believe that our, our constitution has properly addressed that the individual and group rights should be observed by equal measures. But the debate has continued. So the liberal stance of having an individual right is good enough. There is no need to deal about 
national question and a group right. And on the other hand, those who want secession, you know, extremist nationalists um, are posing uh, this question, and again, that made polarization in the country. So that's an issue which we should resolve. I think one important thing from the Ethiopian lesson I just want to, to talk about is nationalism is not all doom and gloom. Nationalism has its own positive things if it is pro properly handled. I will come to the point when President Thabo Mbeki raised how the Ethiopian economy grew very fast the last 18 years with a double digit growth in African continent. Because the nationality and mobilizing people along the nationality line, if it is properly handled, helps to mobilize our social capital properly, putting people at the center of the movement. Because the question is already there. So we tried to mobilize our people along the nationality line, and our constitution has given to have a federal governance system where the federal states considered, in most cases, out of the nine federal regional states, five of them are national regional states. I say this intentionally. They are called, even their names, is national regional governments and national regional states. Because the Oromo nation has its own state. The Amara nation has its own state. And the Somali nation has its own state. And the Afar nation has its own state. But is it sustainable? Can it work? I think this is the question I, I want to pose to the academic community. But for us, you know, the theory is, if you cannot have a national state at the center, then you can have a national state at the regional level, so that the national question can be addressed in a proper sense, where people govern themselves. And self-determination, the principle of self-determination works. In our constitution, we have embraced that self-determination up to cessation should be allowed. The only constitution in Africa where self-determination up to cessation is allowed is our constitution. So this debate is continuing until today in Ethiopia. Some say that this provokes for nations to dissociate, to separate from, from one unified country. The other debate is, we have to make unity attractive. If we are not able to make unity attractive, then nations should be given the right to secede. This is their democratic right. We cannot confine nations into you know, a closed system where you say, I mean, putting the secession agenda uh, cannot be provocative, but the central government will think twice, three times, if this provision is in the constitution, that tomorrow nations will ask for secession if their democratic right is not observed. This is a debatable issue. I think one of the areas where debate has continued in my country is this provision. Um, as I said, but Before I conclude, what are the 
problems of nationalism. I said there is positive things about it. What we witnessed in Ethiopia, even currently, is that it is easy to mobilize people along ethnic line. It's also very easy to radicalize along ethnic line. So the question is, I think the issue of them and us surfaces very quickly. And natives and non-natives issue comes in. I think you, you can also think about this in South Africa, whether it works or not. But in our case, the issue of mobilizing, political mobilizing in terms of ethnicity has created some issues like them and us, natives and non-natives, strangers and uh, you know, owners of that land kind of narrative. Can this function in a democratic, free society? I think this is a big question we have to address in our African context, because that has not been a problem somewhere else. This is our own problem, and we have to deal with it. Of course, in Europe, now, you know, after they call mature democracy, you see that, you know, migrants are considered to be aliens. And so us and them has become an agenda there also. So let's talk about can democracy respond to these kind of things? I think on an issue. So, and the second issue is what the ethnic nationalists often overlook is that identities are multiple and also social historic constructs. There is no fixed identity. It is, I think, are not completely primordial and can shift. Who we are is not explained by our ethnicity or our language alone. Our gender, ideology, religion, socioeconomic class all contribute to our sense of identity. So I think if we have a will, as the liberal nationalist Ernest Renan said, there is something in a man which is superior to language, namely the will. The will to live together. And I tell you today that there is something in a man, in a woman, which is superior to not only language, but also ethnicity, ideology, race, religion, namely the will. So it determines our coexistence. So if there is a will, we can integrate quickly. If there is no will, we cannot do that. So I will conclude by certain points. My first conclusion is that we cannot deny that there is diversity and national question is a reality. There are some groups who are denying that there is no national question. And it can be addressed simply in, in, a, in a manner which I mentioned by just observing individual rights. But to me, that's not true. It's a denial. The national question is a real question in Africa. And we cannot deny its non-existence. I think that's number one. If we do so, then we complicate things. So that denial has made Ethiopia to have 17 armed struggling groups which are ethnic or national based. So we are multinational states and we should work with that knowledge. It might look simple, but it's not as far as our experience is concerned. 
So we have to avoid bipolar tensions. <laughs> and the bipolar tensions are everywhere. The manifestations can be different. So, and therefore, you know, there is a tide that rock our ship right and left. So we need captains that moderate this bipolar tension. How can we do that? My answer is, yes, democratization is the answer, but it's not easy. It's not easy. The Western democratic principles are not on our side because this functions in a homogeneous society. We are heterogeneous society. We, have, we are multinationals. So how can we address this? We need a specific African solution to our problems. Yes, democracy is an existential issue for us. But what kind of democracy should be resolved properly? I now challenge our African intellectuals. Do we have an African answer for this challenge? And the second issue is, we shouldn't leave the national question and democratization to political elite and business elite, for as there are those self, as far as I know, there are political leaders who are selfless to serve their own countries. But because of the class interest of political elites and business elites, we cannot leave democratization on the hands of these groups. That means I'm, I'm coming. I want to criticize the intellectual community's indifference. And we, the intellectual community, if we write an article about this issue is enough for us. But it doesn't transform our society. We cannot sit idle by. We have to fight as an intellectual community without leaving this issue to political elites. And the second issue is I call upon our young people today. What the Algerians have done, what the Sudanese have done, what the Ethiopians have done earlier, you have to do everywhere in the continent. My suggestion is, but you should be organized. Otherwise, like it has been the Ethiopian student movement, it will be snatched by a certain group. So I think you should be very much organized and it should be led intellectually with an intellectual discourse with some ideological line and very much organized political movement. Maybe this one is very sensitive, so. <laughs> um, I think we can moderate the bipolar tension, which I mentioned, by simply having very aggressive and progressive kind of civic movement. But otherwise, what's happening in our continent is the real question of the people is camouflaged by the 
class interest of the political elites for power and prestige and by the business elites for market and accumulation. I think if we don't address this thing, and we, I said we have to catch the bull by the horn. Otherwise, we cannot address these issues in, in a proper sense. So I think this is my recommendation. Since mainstream politics in our continent failed and proved incapable of solving the contemporary national question, an active, organized, and peaceful civic movement is something which should be instituted. I mean, I'm not talking about the haphazard non-organized movements. I'm talking about institutional movements uh, that are needed. So what, how can we do that? Again, I challenge the intellectual community to show us the way how this is going to be instituted, how this is going to be led in a proper way. Again, we have to have a succession plan. I think the demand of our young people is clear. They are impatient. And our population demography, our demography tells us that 70% of our population is below the age of 30. Who's going to understand their, their wishes, their quest? If we all are old people gathered to talk about politics. This might work for Europe, United States, maybe not United States, but mainly Europe because there's aging population. For us in Africa, we need to have this succession plan and it is not tomorrow, but today. Otherwise, our young people disorganized, but they will create the thing which has happened in Algeria and Sudan. So I think young energetic leadership has to lead us. This is their time. And we, the old leaders, should support them. You, we should be backbenchers. This is very pertinent for the success of democratization in our continent. Otherwise, President Becky, we will have many conflict in our continent. So I think, thank you very much for your kind attention. This is the contribution I can make. And thank you so much. And I'm very much uh, honored to be presenting this to you, maybe in our uh, discourse, uh, discussions on our panel, uh, some specific issues can be raised. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Now we will have a beautiful, nice transition, which is part of the succession planning. When we call upon our next program director, who will facilitate the panel, and the person who needs little introduction as a public scholar, as a political economist, the very dynamic leader, Le Bohang Pergo. Over to you, Omar Segenalewo. Thank you. Yeah. 
Honorable guests, dignitaries, former heads of state, acting heads of state, our leadership, trade union leaders, our students, our present, our future, my fellow Africans, sons and daughters of the soil. Good evening to all of us, Dumelanga, Ufela, Sani Bonani, Habarizenu, Mulibwanji, and all protocols are indeed observed on the African soil. I am so excited and I'd like to appreciate very deeply His Excellency's remarks. And in surmising them, I'd also like to invite the two panelists to join us on the stage, Dr. Jimmy Adesine and Ms. Christine Kunta, whom I'll introduce shortly. Please clap for them. So, his Excellency has provided us with some excellent provocations. And I'd like to argue that, in fact, he doesn't also provide us with national question, but national questions. He also gives us the opportunity to think through what does an African identity look like and whether we can negotiate multiple forms of African identity, particularly in the frame of ethno identities, which are sometimes toxic and actually become confederations of what should be national identities. It also means that how do we then think about this them and us? Who is a native and who is a non-native? A question that in South Africa becomes extremely volatile. And indeed, the notion in this country of being a black African, having a hyphenated identity on the African soil is just an example of how we are failing to deal with this complexity and how do we deal with Western democracy? Is it able to respond to the hangovers of a very violent incursion of a former colonial um, presence in this country and on this continent? Remember that national identities, as His Excellency has told us, are about a greater good, a common good, often about a national consciousness it is about a sense of belonging and a sense of being. And I'm hoping that our very competent panelists are going to be able in brief, but in detail, to help us negotiate ideas of peace within nations, forms of being nations in African countries, the idea of class and what it means to be able to then seed class identity as uh, His Excellency has reminded us that oftentimes the elites are the ones who form national identities often to their own interests. Who will be the first to commit class suicide in this regard? And the whole notion of polyethnicity, multi-ethnicity, multiple ways of being, is it possible for us to think about ways of being African when we can't even think of ways of being Kenyan or Somali or Ethiopian or South African or Nigerian or Ghanaian? So I would like to invite our panelists and our respondents to begin to help us to tease out these issues. Um, I'm going to allow His Excellency to ventilate and have a break for a moment. And I would like to invite Ms. Christine Kunta to give a 10 minute, no more, input to help us frame some of these questions. No, you don't have to come here. Kill Mike and me. Thank you, Lebohang. Um, she told me when we were sitting there that she's been told to be brutal with us about time. So I don't know if I should do what they do on Twitter, just say, make statements without qualifying them. But let me start with saying that I'd like to look at South Africa in a little bit more detail. His Excellency's um, um, exposition of Ethiopia and the problems they grapple there with are slightly different in South Africa because um, we, we, while we have in common with the rest of the continent the imposition of colonization, um, which interrupted 
state formation, indigenous state formation on our in our country as elsewhere. In this country, we have a slightly different problem. At this stage of our history, we do not have the kind of secessionist, except perhaps in the Western Cape or Oranje, but um, um, and they haven't yet asked for secession, but um, I think that we don't have deal with that kind of thing. The, what is normally referred to as ethnic, which you are correct, is nationalities. Um, we've, our history has sort of sorted that out. The major problem in South Africa right now is that the national question is really a racial question. It coincides with the, um, with the manner in which we were colonized. And I'd like to frame that um, in the for by, by posing the following question. Can a liberal Western democracy, democracy form of government solve the myriad of problems or that we are, have landed with after 350 years of brutal colonization, which in South Africa was settler colonization? That's the question we are asking, or we should ask. And I would like to suggest that we have two challenges in South Africa right now around that question. The first is that the 1994 settlement did not fundamentally alter the power relations in the country. The Minister of Arts and Culture, I'm assuming is still, when, is the, when do they change the cabinet? Um, they, he once met me and said, you know, we inherited in 1994 the state, but we didn't inherit the nation. Yes. And, I thought, and I thought that was a very profound statement of what we are dealing with in South Africa. And then in 1998, President Mbeki had the, one of his two seminal speeches. He made many, but the two that stand out for us as a country, I'm sure everyone will agree, were this, the two-nation um, speech that he made in 1998, and then I'm an African speech. So I'd like to, I'd like to just... Um, go deeper into that two-nation speech. And here is my position and my view. In South Africa right now, we do not yet have a nation. We have two major groups, the oppressed and the oppressors. Um, I'm loath to say former in the case of oppressors because the infrastructure of colonization or settler colonization is still intact. Um, I don't have time to make examples, but let me make two examples. The economy is completely controlled by white people. Um, Africans don't own any commercial banks. There is not a single African-owned commercial bank in this country. We don't control the food chain from the farming to taking it to pick and pay. We have no control over that. We are locked out of the economy, despite the ANC government, and people can criticize the ANC government, I have many criticisms, but they have tried within the constitutional framework to deracialize the economy. But every step they have taken to do that have been fought by people who own our land, who own our economy, and so we have arrived at a very difficult place that I believe we actually, the is issue of building a proper nation has stalled from 1998 from President Mbeki's speech. We haven't moved much in the next 20 years. And let me give a few examples. How far am I? <laughs> let me give a few examples. A nation state, and I'm very interested in your analysis and your view of the European Max Weber and so. 
I've looked at all this and I've come to the following conclusion. And I'll, I'll, I'll say it by way of saying we do not have a nation in this country. Between us and the descendants of those who came to the country from Europe, we don't share a common set of values. And I'll explain that. The Constitution tried to give us that shared sense of values, equality, dignity, but the minority does not accept that. Otherwise, they would not fight the government when the government says through the charter, like the mining charter, they would accept the concept of de-racializing the economy. They would accept employment equity and we wouldn't have the kind of figures we have now. So we do not accept the constitutional principle of equality. So we don't share a value, we don't share culture, our heroes, we don't share a history either. Their heroes are for Wurt, de Klerk, P.W. Buter. Our heroes, our heroes are Sobukwe, and I'm black consciousness and PAC, so Soboque starts, Sisulu. Um, with the only hero we have in common is Mandela, but the reason they venerate Mandela um, is because they believe that he's talking about reconciliation, gave them a free pass. And that's why. But so we do not have anything in common with each other except the geography. But geography cannot denote um, nationhood. Finally, I've got two minutes. <laughs> um, I'd like to propose, and I agree with His Excellency, I think if colonization interrupted indigenous state formation, the job of intellectuals and scholars would be to go and find the indigenous principles of state formation and nationhood that enabled countries to govern themselves for 4,000 years. And, and if they do that, and it can be done, you will remember, President Mbeki will remember that there was a history project that was done, both by South Africa and UNESCO. So, because the imposition of a Western democratic system assumes the illegitimacy of indigenous forms of governance, and it cannot remain like that. In South Africa, the biggest risk we face from the inability to resolve the national question is this, that a group of people, a minority, whose loyalty to the country is at best ambivalent, controls our economy completely. That is a big risk. The second biggest risk is that 55% of young people who constitute the majority are unemployed. The landlessness, poverty, is going to create a situation where this country will explode if it is not resolved. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Alice Christine. I think that's um, robust food for thought. Without further ado, I'd like Professor Adesini to tease out some of these issues. I know that he's got a lot to say about post-ethnicity, um, he's got a lot to say about a sociological viewpoint of what nation versus nations are. And um, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And then uh, let me just uh, express my appreciation to the, the foundation for the invitation to be part of this panel. I'll, I'll, I'll stay out of the South African uh, discourse for a moment, you know, and deal with the continental. Um, and... and I would, I would like to, I mean, I agree significantly with what uh, His Excellency, uh, uh, you know, set out. What I, what I would like to actually highlight is, is there, there are two 
at least two dominant f ways of addressing the, what is called the nationality question. And whatever the definition may be, on the African continent, the nationality question tends to coincide with ethnic identities. Now, the ethnic identities themselves are not fixed. Uh, they, they, they've evolved over time. Um, and and in, 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 in a number of cases, they were interrupted by colonialism. In other cases, they were, they, they were, they were invented and, and ossified by colonial modalities of governance. Okay. The experience, however, and Ethiopia is an example of that, Nigeria is an example of that, my own native country, Kenya is an example of that. The experience on the continent is that when we structure our political system along ethnic identities, the ethnic identities don't dissipate, they ossify. Okay? They don't. Um, and many of the invented communities in terms of ethnicity themselves are in some cases products of post-colonial, not just even in terms of the colonial fragmentation. So for instance, what does it mean to say in the Nigerian context somebody is Habe? What does it mean to say somebody is Yoruba, for instance, uh, or somebody is Igbo? Uh, you have a whole movement in the country at the moment uh, talking about a secession movement. Now, I, I will agree with you on this, and I, this is central. It has to be a way in which we structure our debate. I'm a Pan-Africanist. I don't see how a retreat into ethnic identities can resolve any of our problems. I, look, if you give me the, the, the God's power to do this, I'll reduce African countries to just 10. Okay? First of all, we already have too many small states. From an economic point of view, Ethiopia may be different, Nigeria may be different, uh, but there's just too many. And that was why, as part of the Lagos Plan of Action and the African Economic, what do you call it, Community Project, which manifested in 1991, the whole idea of creating regional economic communities as the, as the platform for economic uh, you know, what do you call it, uh, 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 activities. But we have another example of multiracial, multi-ethnic identity, of, of, of realities of almost a hundred ethnic groups, four racial groups, that in fact were able to construct what we call a post-ethnic identity. And that's Tanzania. Tanzania, as, 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 as Mahmoud Mamdani reminds us, is arguably Africa's most successful nation building project. How did it happen? It was not a denial of racial, I mean, that you have the indigenous African, you have the Afro Arab, you have the uh, Asian, people of Asian descent, people of European descent. And then you have many ethnic groups in the you know. Leadership matters. Policy matters. Leadership matters in the sense in which those who run the country who are in charge of the country themselves project a post-ethnic identity. So if you, if any, if you remember this, uh, within a few months of, of, of Tangaika then uh, becoming independent, a bill was brought to the parliament which said that citizenship of Tangaika will be restricted to only indigenous Africans. You have the Afro-Arabs, you have the people of Asiatic background, you have the people of European background, and so that, you know. Mwalimu, was, it was part of the, he opposed it vehemently. It was part of the reason why he resigned as prime minister. Within a few months of, less than two years of being, of the independence, and then toward the country, party work to be done in terms of what you call it. I, what you call it. Now, this is not the same thing as not being sensitive to racism and what you call it. Uh, people will remember that, that uh, uh, clubs were closed down, uh, you know, these golf clubs were closed down because they denied 
membership to uh, indigenous Africans. Hmm. Um, there was, a, there was a, a safari hotel that was closed down. There were some British who were expelled from Tang Tanganyika for racism. So the leadership itself becomes important because, look, my, my sense, if I take the Nigerian example, is that this is, this is elite politics. Okay? The same thing in Kenya. When you have, when you have politics organized around almost ethnic warlords, people who claim they represent their own ethnicity and things like that, when on the ground it makes no difference to the Hausa person in, Med in Medukuri, for instance, the, the problem of poverty and equality is what pro produced Boko Haram. But what did Tanzania do? Because, you know, a lot of the examples, illustrations we need on the, to resolve African problems reside within Africa. Somebody mentioned uh, uh, Abdullah Batili here. I mean, we may remember this, that in Senegal, which is about 90-something percent Muslim, 80-something um, percent Wolof, Seda Senghor was president for 27 years, a Seren, minority of a minority, and a Catholic. So let me come back to Tanzania, because the Tanzanian example is important, where policy, leadership matters, but policy matters. That even in the acknowledgments of multi-ethnicity, and the fact that we know that these ethnic identities work in progress. I'm sorry, I don't want to get too much into this, but what 250 years ago will have, what, what will it mean to say you are Zulu? Mm. No, no. What, what will it mean to say, you know, I mean, when we say, for instance, I'm a crosses, for instance, we speak of it in a singular. When in fact, this one, multiple